Welcome to section 20.5 and 20.6. Okay, gentle people, the first thing we're going to talk about in this lecture is something called the mass defect. So let's go ahead and take a look at the magnesium 25 nucleus. So if we look at magnesium 25, what we would know is that magnesium has 12 protons and magnesium 25, well, 25 minus 12 gets me 13 neutrons. Now you guys can go ahead and take a look at the mass of a proton and the mass of a neutron. So it stands to reason what I can do is take the mass of the proton, times it by 12, take the mass of the neutron, times it by 13, and if I add these two things together, I should get the expected mass of this total nuclei. And so this is the expected mass. Okay, now that we have that established, let's go into the lab and let's go measure the actual mass of a magnesium-25 nucleus. And what you guys will find is it weighs this amount. Now, if you guys take a look at this, these are different numbers. In fact, somehow I've lost a little bit of mass. So if I take the expected mass and subtract it from the actual mass, the difference between these two masses, the expected and the actual, is listed as 3.40879 times 10 to the negative 25th grams. So just to give you an analogy, you took a five pound weight, you added it to a six pound weight, and instead of getting 11 pounds, you measured the combined weight and it turns out to be 10. So this is what's called the mass defect. The sum of the parts do not equal the whole. So what happened here and how can we explain this phenomenon? It took a very smart person to put this all together. That person's name, Albert Einstein. And what he did is he came up with this formula, E equals mc squared. And what he proposes with this equation is that mass and energy are interchangeable. They are two sides of the same coin. They are just different forms of something that is in nature. When we put these subatomic particles together, what we're doing is we're converting some of that mass into energy. And so we can apply this equation. We can take that mass difference or the mass defect that we that we saw in our previous slide. We can do a little bit of conversion and then we can times it by the speed of light squared. And so this is the energy that is released when I form that nucleus. This energy is called the binding energy. And this is the reason that protons and neutrons come together. You might think that we're bringing a whole bunch of little particles and bringing them together. And so this would be something that would go against entropy. But it turns out when we put all these little things together, there's a release of a tremendous amount of energy. Now, if you take a look at this, this looks kind of small, 3.07 times 10 to the negative 11th joules. But remember, this is per nucleus. So this is making one atom or one nucleus of magnesium 25. If I were to go ahead and calculate making one mole of magnesium 25, that equates to 1.85 times 10 to the 13 joules per mole. Making one mole of magnesium 25 out of protons and neutrons would have released the equivalent to 400 metric tons of gasoline. And so you can see why we look to the nucleus for energy. So going to the binding energy, we can take a look at all the elements on the periodic table. What this graph gives you is the mass number and the binding energy per nucleus. So what that means is this is the amount of energy that is released if I make hydrogen, if I make helium, and as I go down the periodic table. What you guys will see is that there is one most stable nucleus, and that is iron 56. This is the most stable nucleus in the entire universe. Now, what you guys will note is that after I get higher or heavier than iron 56, we still release a ton of energy, but not as much as iron 56 releases. 
So what does this mean? We want to go to the most lowest energy form, which in this case is iron 56. And so what's going to happen is anything lighter than iron 56, so things like hydrogen and helium, well, these smaller nuclei have a tendency to want to combine with other nuclei to get bigger such that it reaches iron 56. Now, if I'm heavier than iron 56, so if I'm like mercury or uranium, well, I want to go ahead and break apart. So I want to shed some of my nucleus and become iron 56. And so these are the two processes that I want to discuss. When I combine two lighter nuclei to make a more stable nuclei, this is called fusion. I fuse these two nuclei together. If I have a heavier thing, I can crack it and break it apart into smaller parts. And so if I take a heavy nuclei, what I can do is a process called fission. So let's go ahead and talk about the fission process first. Now, the fission process is the basis of some nuclear weapons and our nuclear power plants. So here's the idea. Uranium-235 is a bigger nucleus than iron-56. So what that means is, is I can crack this open, and if I make smaller nuclei, I can release energy from this nucleus. So one way I can do this is I can start bombarding it with neutrons. When I bombard it with neutrons, I make this super unstable nucleus, uranium-236. Now, uranium-236 is going to readily break up into barium-141, krypton-92, and it is going to generate three neutrons. So I want you guys to understand this. Uranium-235 is more stable than uranium-236. You can find uranium-235 in nature. And so to get this reaction started, I had to introduce neutrons or bombard my nucleus with neutrons to make it a more unstable nucleus, and then I can get this nuclear reaction to proceed. However, one of the products that I formed are neutrons. And what can happen is these neutrons can go and find another uranium-235 and kick off another reaction. And so this reaction is self-sustaining. Once I kick this reaction off, I start a chain reaction. Now, what does that mean? Well, if one of the three neutrons finds another uranium-235, then my reaction just continues forward. One of those three will find another uranium that will generate three neutrons. One of those three will find another uranium and so on and so forth. And so if I have enough uranium-235, I call this a critical mass. And that means that I can continue my reaction and it will go on forever. Now, if I have a subcritical mass, what that means is when I go ahead and break open my uranium, those three neutrons that I generated, they don't find another uranium. And that means my reaction eventually stops, and so I end my nuclear reaction. However, there's another scenario, and that's called the supercritical mass. If I generate three neutrons per reaction, well, what can happen is two of those neutrons or three of those neutrons can each find another uranium. And what that means is my reaction is going to start to go out of control. My two becomes four, my four becomes eight, and suddenly my reaction goes out of control and explodes. So these are the premises when I do a nuclear reaction. The supercritical mass, well, this is something if you want to make a nuclear bomb because you're releasing a tremendous amount of energy really fast. With the critical mass, this is something that you want in a nuclear reactor or a power plant. You have a continuous reaction that continues to produce energy. So let's go ahead and calculate the amount of energy that I can get out of one gram of uranium-235. So let's say I put this in my reactor. Here are some information for you guys. Calculate how much energy I get out of a gram of uranium-235.
All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to answer this quiz question like every scientist wants to try to do, and that's write down Einstein's famous equation, E equals mc squared. Now, in this course of my reaction, I'm going to have a change in energy. Now, since the speed of light is constant, my change of energy comes with a change in mass. So what I want to find out, really, is my delta mass. Now, remember what the delta sign means. It means the final state minus the initial states, or in this case, the mass of my products minus the mass of my reactant. So before I calculate my mass, I want to go ahead and convert everything into moles because that's the unit conversions that I have given you and that's the data that I've given you. So let's go ahead and start with one gram of uranium-235 and turn that into moles. So one gram divided by the molecular weight of uranium-235 and what I get is about 0.005. 425 moles. Now, in these types of reactions, these nuclear reactions, I want you guys to use a whole bunch of decimal places. If you don't, you'll get the wrong answer. Some of these changes are really small, and you have to write a whole bunch of significant figures out to notice this difference. So from now on, you guys are going to see me write like seven or eight significant figures, and I suggest you do the same when you do book problems and you do your exam. So the next thing we should do is we should calculate the molar mass of a neutron. And so to do that, we are given the grams of one neutron. So let's get it per mole of neutron. So one neutron is 1.675 times 10 to the negative 24th. And I'm going to go ahead and times this by Avogadro's number. And so what I get is the atomic mass of a neutron being 1.008665 grams per mole. All right, ladies and gentlemen, now what we're ready to do is calculate the mass of my reactants. All right, ladies and gentlemen, now we're ready to calculate the mass of our reactants. So on our reactant side, we are going to go ahead and use the moles of uranium. And so I have 0 0.00425 moles of my uranium. And so remember, our uranium on our slide, we said it's 235.044 grams per mole. So the other thing on our reactant side is our neutrons. So this is in a one-to-one -one ratio with our uranium. So if I had 0 0.00425 uranium, that means I have 0 0.00425 of my neutrons. And we just calculated how much a neutron weighs. And doing this calculation out, we get a mass of 1.00425. 4293 grams. All right, let's go ahead and do the mass of our products. So on our product side, the first thing we have is barium-141. Now remember, it is in a one-to-one -one ratio with our uranium. So if I have 0 0.0425 of uranium, then I have 0 0.00425 of my barium. I'm going to put its molecular weight and then the next nuclei on my product side is krypton. And again, one-to-one -one ratio with my uranium, so 0 0.00425. And then I can put its molecular weight. Now, the last thing on my product side is I have neutrons. And I have three neutrons. So if I look at my mole ratios, for every one uranium I have, I'm getting three neutrons out of this. So that means I'm going to take the moles of my uranium, 0 0.00425 moles, and times it by 3 because that's my mole ratio. Now I'm going to go ahead and times this by the molar mass of my neutrons that I calculated out. And then if I do this calculation out, I get 1.00301. And so again, this is why I tell you guys to go out to six or seven significant figures or six or seven decimal places 
because if you guys cut it at two decimal places, you won't see a difference between these two. So now what I can do is I can do my delta mass. So again, remember my delta mass is the mass of my reactants minus the mass of my products. So if I do this calculation out, minus 0 0.000792 is the amount of grams that I lost. This amount of grams, remember, gets converted into energy. So my delta E is going to equal my delta mass, and then I'm gonna go ahead and times it by C squared. So three times 10 to the eighth. And so I can do this calculation out, negative 7.13 times 10 to the 13 grams per meter squared per second squared. Now I can go ahead and divide this by 1,000, minus 7.13 times 10 to the 10th, and this gets me kilograms meters squared over second squared. And you guys will remember that this is equivalent to joules. And so the energy released is negative 7.13 times 10 to the 10th joules. So this is a tremendous amount of energy that we get just out of one gram of uranium-235. And because it produces so much energy, this is why we use uranium-235 in some of our nuclear reactors. And so this is just a basic schematic. So what's gonna happen here is you are going to have these fuel rods. We're gonna initiate that reaction and we're gonna get that uranium and we're gonna try to keep it under a critical mass. That means I'm gonna control how many neutrons are hitting uranium-235. I'm going to try to make it such that one neutron hits one uranium-235. So this part, my reactor vessel, is going to generate a whole bunch of energy. And so I'm going to take that energy and I'm going to pump it into a steam generator. Basically, this amount of heat is going to go ahead and heat up some water. The water is going to get converted to steam. It turns a steam turbine. And then later on, there's a cooling system that recondenses my water so it can go ahead and be heated up again. So this is part of the reason why you see nuclear reactors next to large bodies of water like the ocean or a lake. You need a lot of water to cool that water that you've just heated up through a nuclear reaction. And this process is about 55 to 60 percent efficient. If you guys have never seen nuclear fuel, uh, what you guys can take a look at is this picture right here. These are the actual fuel pellets that they use in nuclear reactors. They're about the size of a dime. They put these uh, cylinders into these big rods, and these fuel rods are what's actually used in a nuclear reactor. They're bundled up into what's called a fuel assembly, and in between the fuel assembly, they will do these control rods. Now, the control rods are things that are going to control the flux of neutrons so that my nuclear reaction never gets supercritical. Remember, supercritical means that your reaction is going out of control and it has a tendency to explode or release way too much energy than you can handle. So that was a fission reaction. I'm taking a heavier nucleus and I'm breaking it up into smaller nuclei. Now there's a fusion reaction that you guys see every day of your life, and that is the sun. Our sun is a yellow dwarf star, and so what it is doing is it's taking hydrogen and it is combining this hydrogen to make helium. And so what I'm doing is I'm taking two smaller nuclei and making it into a bigger nuclei. And because of this reaction, you can see that there is a tremendous release of energy. All of life is based off this fusion reaction. The core temperature of our sun is 1.5 times 10 to the seventh. In the grand scheme of things, this is actually considered a low temperature and is not hot enough to make some of the heavier elements. And I'll talk about that in a little bit later, but there is research into trying to do fusion here on Earth. 
So remember what we have to overcome. If you guys remember, what we can do is we can take one hydrogen atom and another hydrogen atom and we can bring them together. Now what we told you in Chem 1B is we can start these hydrogens infinitely far apart from each other. And I can bring them closer and closer and then eventually they will form a bond. And that's where the electrons on this hydrogen see the nucleus on this hydrogen and the electrons on this hydrogen see the nucleus on this one. And so I lower the energy of my system and I make H2 gas. Now, if I start bringing those two hydrogen atoms together closer and closer, well, this proton starts to see this proton. And so that's an unfavorable reaction. And I can't bring them close together without inputting a lot of energy. And so this doesn't happen under normal chemical reactions. If I manage to squeeze it tighter and tighter, all of a sudden they fuse together and I get a whole drop in energy of my system. And when it fuses, the energy is released. Now we haven't been able to do this efficiently on planet Earth, but we are trying different kinds of systems to try to get a fusion reaction going. Our sun is considered a small star it starts off burning hydrogen and turning that hydrogen into helium. It'll go through different phases, and eventually what small stars make, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and possibly neon and sulfur. Now, if you want the heavier elements, well, you're gonna have to go to bigger stars because bigger stars can get to those temperatures when you can start fusing things like calcium, scandinavium and zirconium together. Now for certain heavy elements, you're gonna need to have a star explode or go under a star's death, a supernova. And it is only under supernova conditions that we make elements like iodine, nickel, and cobalt. Now what you guys will note is iodine, nickel, and cobalt are things that you can find in your body. These are elements that you need to be healthy. And so what I can say to you, ladies and gentlemen, is that you guys are literally made out of the stuff of stars. And for you to exist, a supernova had to have occurred. And so, ladies and gentlemen, with that saccharine thought, I bid you congratulations. Congratulations for finishing your Chem 1 series. This is the final lecture and I wish you guys well.